Well, hello there, and welcome to part two of Genre Grinder's epic look back at every single slasher film released in the year 1981. If you didn't listen to part one and for some reason don't want to, Patrick and I covered Scream, Ghost Keeper, Corpse Mania, Home Sweet Home, A Day of Judgment, Shri Gala, Night School, The House Where Death Lives, My Bloody Valentine, Eyes of a Stranger, Murder Obsession, Madhouse, Fun House, Love Massacre, and Bloody Moon. So, without further ado, let's continue. brings us to The Phantom Killer, which is our last Hong Kong movie, directed by Stanley Fung. Uh, this was uh, one I found a bootleg copy of. It said it had subtitles. It did not have subtitles. So, Boy, you really committed to this one. Yeah. I, you know, episode. at a certain point, at a certain point, you just got to watch all the movies. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. Uh this is a Golden Harvest production, uh, not Shar Brothers, so they're kind of a rival studio. Um, so it might have been made to directly compete with Corpse Media. I'm not sure. Uh, Corpse Media is the better of the two, but this one is Kung Fu slasher movie, if that's what you're looking for. Um, it, it There's very little I can find about it. There's no wiki page. The INDB page doesn't even have a plot. The plot on... The letterboxed is talented, young, handsome, see you, uh, is a hero up to the townsfolk and an idol to the girls. Still, he has an avowed enemy, bad man Cam. Lately, several girls are murdered immediately after they meet see you. Sheriff Chu is unable to find a lead, but decides to trail see you. See you calls his, oh my God, this just keeps going. Uh, yeah, it's a murder mystery. <laughs> <laughs> Stanley Fung uh, was uh, also known as Siu Fang Fung uh, was a uh, actor for the most part um, and he was actually just in a couple movies he's still acting it's a uh, kung fu period drama meets slasher movie um, and they use uh, camera tricks and trampolines rather than wire work but it still has that kind of supernatural thing uh, that a lot of 80s and especially early 90s uh Hong Kong action has. Uh, Billy Chan is credited as stunt coordinator uh, who works with Samuel Hung a lot on Magnificent Butcher and My Lucky Stars, uh, which co-stars Jackie Chan. Those are two very good movies. And then Billy Chan also directed uh, Crazy Safari, which is a movie that crosses over the priest from the Mr. Vampire movies and the Bushman from The Gods Must Be Crazy. Uh, they got the right, the exact actor to it. It's, it's not as good as it sounds. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> it's not as good as it sounds. The killer's costume is this kind of cool uh, paper mache or enamel, whatever it is, uh, skull mask, and he has the big brim bamboo coolie hat um, with eye holes, the thing that you see in a lot of those kind of kung fu movies. Uh, and there's a cool part where they discover that a body that the killer has hidden a body in a sculpture, uh, sort of like bucket of blood. Um, but they discovered it's kind of in a nastier way. And there was a particularly funny scene where, uh, uh, the, uh, young heroine, uh, follows the killer out of curiosity. The killer beckons her. She knows there's a killer. This might be the killer, but she still follows him out into the, uh, uh, middle of nowhere. And uh, gets so startled by a scarecrow in the same costume, and she beats the hell out of this scarecrow that doesn't move. And then when the guy tries to get her, she grabs a big old tree branch and crushes this, the mask, which uh, is meant to reveal that this is a phantom and not a person. But the later twist is that uh, there's actually more than one person behind this, but the person doing the killing is a dwarf 
using head and arm extensions. So you can... <laughs> wait, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> so you can bash the head off this thing, and it's not a real human head under the mask. The human head's down in the stomach. Are you sure this movie isn't better than Corpse Mania? It it doesn't have the craft of Corpse Mania. It's still pretty good. Um, it also has uh, not uncommon for Hong Kong movies to steal uh, music or use catalog music. Uh, this one, its main theme is the main theme from Phantasm. It's just okay. Phantasm. It's just absolutely the song from Phantasm. Plays if you're gonna lives. rip off, if you're gonna rip off a movie's theme music, Phantasm's a fine choice. The IMDb says it's also music from Fantastic Planet. I don't know which Fantastic Planet they meant. Either Another way. fine choice. I don't. I don't know the full score, but if it's the French animated film, yeah, that's that what is, I'm wondering. That is a funky ass jazz fusion soundtrack. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if uh, this one got uh, Blu-ray released by like I don't know, there's uh, there's a couple companies. 88 Films in the UK does Hong Kong horror. Uh, this this would be something I'd watch again. It's pretty good. Uh, and that brings us to Bloody Birthday. Which is another, yeah. I believe, fan favorite. Now, this is one that you'll probably talk about on in a later episode. Yeah, this is really a killer kid movie. This is an evil child movie um, that has slasher accoutrements. It even starts like a kind of Halloween style slasher movie. Um, there's a character who's kind of a Laurie Strode stand in. Um, and one of her friends is the daughter of a local sheriff like um, Nancy Loomis. But I think that that's there to kind of uh, trick us because I think it's sort of slightly, I don't know. It, 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 it's, it's a disguised evil kid movie that then reveals itself as an evil kid movie. Um, it's got downtown Julie Brown uh, mm-hmm. in a new dancing sequence, if anybody's into that. Um, but it's really generally just a really good, good sleazy but not obscenely sleazy uh evil kids it's got a very good a combination of kind of tv movie production values like the music and the look and everything just kind of feels low rent and quick um so it kind of feels sanitized except that it is actually like really it goes there uh especially with the kids it pulls no punches yeah. Um, in terms of what the things they do and not just to adults, but to other kids. Yeah. Uh, and so it is a really fun movie to watch, uh, especially to like drop on someone who doesn't know what to expect. Uh, and because it's kind of shocking in moments and the kids, there are three killer kids in it. And one of them gets no, basically no lines of dialogue and no personality and no storyline. Um, the other two do all the work and they are both exceptional child actors. Yeah. The boy is just all around a good actor Mm -hmm. and the girl does one of the best mixes of pretending to be innocent. Uh, but, but secretly is, is much more mature and scary. Like that's something I, a lot of kid actors try to do that. I don't think they pull off. There is, I, this is the entirety of my, letterbox review when i rewatched this uh for this podcast mine is about her and specifically a single moment in it um which is that they ask for no homework over the weekend because their birthday is over the weekend the whole thing is that they were all born on the same day and there's some like astrological implications. yeah they're not they're not related they're not triplets no they just were all born on the same day during an eclipse um and therefore they're evil uh and they ask, oh, like, can we have no homework over the weekends? Because our birthday is going to be then and we want everyone at our party. And the teacher is the classic, like, stern, uh, mean uh, uh, school teacher who's just like, <laughs> she goes, just because you are all share a birthday doesn't make you special. And there is this moment, it is like maybe a second and a half long, where uh, the uh, the little girl actor, whose name is Elizabeth Hoy, just sort of looks at her and like has an entire world of thoughts where it's like, you dumb bitch. You don't even know. You don't fucking know. I'll fucking (laughs) kill you. You dumb bitch. Like we're, we're the fucking greatest kids who have ever lived. How dare you imply we're not the most precious children who have ever walked upon God's green earth. You stupid bitch. And then she just sort of smiles and goes, okay. 
<laughs> I lost my mind. I had to pause the movie. I was just laughing for a solid minute. It is so incredible. I apologize yeah. for saying bitch so much, but like that is uh, that's the express. That is what she is portraying as a character. Yes, and you're portraying uh, her. Yeah, 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 yeah. This isn't um, Patrick speaking. Uh, oh God, it is. They are so good, and like this movie is not particularly well made. It's not a great slasher movie. It's not scary really at all, other than just being like generally more disturbing than you expect a little kids killer kids movie to be. Um, but they th- are they elevated, and it's not often that uh, little kids are able to elevate the movie they're in, but they genuinely do. And I don't think any of them really went on to have much of an acting career. And that's actually a common. It, it, I actually quite like evil kid movies, um, but all the best ones have either uh, are are really well made, have really good kid actors, or have some sort of really bizarre uh, gimmick to them. All right, but we should move on because you're going to talk. So more about yeah, that yeah, I'll later. talk about that tonight. So and then another one I don't really think we need to talk about that long is Friday Thirteenth Part Two. I do want to say Friday Thirteenth Part Two. Uh, after the end of the first film, it's it, it. This is okay. So the Friday Thirteenth series has a whole thing where it takes place in the future because they kept doing yes. big time jumps in between sequels, even though they released a movie every year. Yes. So this movie takes place about tenish years after the first film. They reopen the camp. Uh, this time it's not Jason's mother. It's Jason himself. This is the introduction of Jason before he had the hockey mask. He has the uh, elephant. No, not the elephant man sack. He has the. Uh, yeah, it's the elephant man sack in this It's one. the town that dreaded sundown. Sun- yeah, you're right. The because town we talked sundown. about this on the Proto Slasher yeah, episode where we did. The, it's not just the sack on his face, but also the way they shoot him by shooting his boots and the jeans is yeah. all town that dreaded sundown. I will say. We don't need to talk a lot about this because this is the movie most likely to have been seen by yes. listeners to this podcast. I think this is the scariest Friday Thirteenth movie. I think it is one of the more accomplished Friday Thirteenth movies. I think Steve Miner is one of the better directors to direct a Friday Thirteenth movie. Um, I think this one's better than Three, which he also directed. Yes, I I like Three a lot. I think I like Three more than a lot of people, but uh, this is the better of the two. Um, this has a, has a really good cast of teenagers. Um, it has a lot of little things that are not what you, it's like, oh, this doesn't, this is just what movies do. This is not make a movie great. But in the realm of Friday 13th movies, Steve Miner puts a little more thought into it than most people. And there's just little setups and payoffs of like a spear that comes up later and a, a missing dog that you think got killed by Jason. And then there's a fake out with that. And there's just a lot of little touches that add up to a slasher movie that is way more accomplished than a lot of its peers, uh, especially in its own franchise. Yeah. My only two notes is that one, Amy Steele is the, probably the best final girl in this franchise. She's so and good. She's, she's good on, a lot of levels she's really really good and i i don't think it's hyperbole to say this um and also this is one that was hurt by mpaa cuts ah mpaa was angry because they got shit for letting the first friday 13th go through uncut and so they really took it out on a lot of movies the next year but especially this one and you can tell there are some really jagged cutaways from what would probably have been a really cool uh, bloody special effect. Um, this is one, I think this is one of the, we've had so many movies that we know were cut for our ratings, uh, that they found the footage. This is, I think one of the few Holy grails of that type left. There's still like missing movies and movies that are director's cuts that are missing. This is one where just the gore footage to be found would be a a pretty big deal. Do you you think that it's just that for this series, the footage is genuinely missing outside of like weird work print videotape? Or do you think it's that it's owned by a major studio and therefore they're less willing? Yes, I think... I think that if uh, somebody like Scream Factory or Synapse Films or Blue Underground or Arrow got their hands on these somehow, they would be able to find this footage, I think. Because the, uh, um, like, they released, quote unquote, Paramount released the first film, the uncut version, and it's basically identical. 
and it and from what i understand that was actually a mistake uh originally they didn't realize that they were releasing there was such a small cut to it that they didn't even realize they were releasing an un, uncut version until someone pointed it out mm-hmm. to them but uh obviously even more so than this film later entries in the series like uh especially like part seven seven is big yeah and they have some of the footage on the blu-ray but it looks like vhs right quality it's hard to tell what's happening and it's not put back into the movie i think it needs to be back in the movie to to really count um at any rate i think this movie is a very good slasher movie i really do enjoy it i like the fright i like all the big studio slasher franchises i think more than you do gabe Um, um yeah well we'll get to one in a bit here but i do really like the first uh six friday 13th and the first five nightmare on elm streets sure oh, okay so it's just, it's just mostly the halloween sequels that you don't have yeah. any use of I, yeah okay we'll but <laughs> yeah no for sure other thing worth noting is this movie came out um around summer of 1981 so the last movie we're going to be talking about that came out in november of 1981 is the prowler and that movie has the same sort of ending there's a sequence where the final girl is who looks just like amy Steele, yeah um is hiding under some furniture and then like a rat comes up to her yeah it's like exact duplicate but i saw stuff about i saw facts about the prowler that imply that maybe it was shot in 1980 and it was sort of put on it was shelved for a long time um i don't know if that's true or not uh but sure. we can talk maybe a little bit more about that later when the Prowler comes up. But if 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 this if the Prowler ripped off Friday Thirteenth Part Two, it's possible because a lot of these movies had really quick turnarounds. But yeah, uh, they they do have weirdly similar uh, endings. Yeah, um, not as weirdly similar as uh, Madhouse and uh, Happy Birthday to Me, but yes. Um, which brings us to Graduation Day, directed by Herb Freed, who directed a couple decent B movies, The um, Haunts and Beyond Evil. Uh, this one, I've, I've slacked off on the descriptions. Uh, after a high school track runner named Laura suddenly dies from a heart attack after finishing a 30-second 200-meter race, a killer wearing sweats, a sweatsuit and fencing mask begins killing off her friend's on the school track team, one by one. Uh, this is a, a bad movie that I like. It's very fun. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Uh, my my favorite thing about the entire movie is the opening titles look like a promotional short for a track and field that like they'd show you in school in the 70s or 80s. It's like a bunch of B-roll sports like I, shot at like I, low angles. I think you're and, underselling the editing phantasmagoria that is the opening <laughs> credits of this movie. It's, it's, it's a disco song. And it's cut to the rhythm of the disco song. It's incredible looking. It's it's and, it's borderline experimental editing. And the, the, the and it just keeps shouting, "Everybody wants to be a winner." It, but it really does. Okay, okay. I won't say promotional track and field. I'll say this is an official Olympic uh, track and field promo. Yes, yes. That you would see as a, a between Pepsi commercials. Absolutely. In the 80s. Okay. I, it feels like at some point in time the editor for whatever reason, had an extra week where it was like, oh, we got to reshoot this. So the, you thought you were going to be editing these scenes, but we don't have those for you. It, yeah. it feels like someone had too much time on their hands and just went so fucking extra. <laughs> and there's a couple scenes throughout there. There's a couple murder scenes that have that same editing thing. Yeah. Um, this is not a well-made movie. This is not a particularly artsy horror film like you would hope it to be from the opening but, credits. But you think it is from the... Uh, I always expect Christopher George to turn to the camera and say, Hi, I'm Hollywood actor Christopher George. You may remember <laughs> me from such classics as City Living Dead. Yeah. I'm here today to talk to you about sports. Ah, <laughs> uh, so good. And then... And I, I also like that this movie... Um, is just a fucking Bugs Bunny cartoon when it comes yeah. to the actual kills. Well, it's as close as I think uh, we would get if we're not counting Final Destination Five to a sports slasher. I don't know if there, I mean, there again. You're right. There's probably some weird trauma movie that's all about sports equipment being used to kill people. Um, but the killer does use sports equipment the entire movie, and time has a has a time clock to tie into the 
a stopwatch, a time clock, a stopwatch to tie into the um, beginning of the fact that the, the, the killer's avenging this young lady who had a heart attack because uh, this asshole PE teacher it, at, it, and at a high school. Is this a high school? It is a high school. Why is this guy so aggro? It's just high school. <laughs> he, he, is, he is as if it is a Texas football team. But it's also he's also the track and the uh, gymnastics teacher. He's like both. The uh, there, there's some good kills and there's some some funny kills. <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, yeah, the, it's good uh, killer POV shots. Um, there's a really nice shot where we can uh, see a darkened reflection of the killer in a window uh, during a tracking shot through the girls' uh, locker room. Uh, the camera's following, and we could see that he's on the other side of a window, but she doesn't see him. Uh, that was actually a pretty good scary shot. It has Lena Quigley in it. Um, Which character is she? Because I saw her in the credits and then immediately forgot, and I could not pick her out of the lineup. She's the blonde. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, she replaced the other actress who decided she didn't want to do nudity. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. So she gets beheaded, and then later in the movie, they never had. they didn't have time to make a head molding of her so later in the movie when the killer displays all the bodies um it's the other actress's head <laughs> who she replaced and the uh the the dialogue oh yeah the killer wears black gloves which is sort of giallo-esque um and then there's a uh a live band part that again doesn't really have much to do with the story but they're all dressed as 1930s gangsters um th- and that the reason they are so into that song is because it was the name of the band was felony they um gave them the song they said you didn't have they didn't have they don't have to pay any licensing fees for that song um, well it paid off because now felony is a household name ex- well honestly honestly <laughs> where else was felony going to go with that you know I, mean, I think it was a good idea myself <laughs> because uh because that is the only way anybody's going to remember the local whatever town band felony is the fact that they were in this one this one movie. And so at least their music was heard. And it was in the trailers, too. That's the other thing. I'm sure some horror convention has reunited felony. I'm sure. At some positively. point. I, as, as someone who has seen Herschel Gordon-Lewis perform uh, The South is Going to Rise Again live, like, that yeah. happens. Yeah. Uh, um, also, okay, so I have the J.A. Kirschwell book, the slasher movie book in front of me, and he says that this movie cost $250,000, which is extremely low, um, and that it topped the U- the uh, L.A. box office um, before it went wider than just L.A. If you go on I, – I, it's either IMDb or Box Office Mojo, it's like <laughs> they claim it's some absurd amount of money, like $16 million or something like that. <laughs> Which I don't know if that's true. It's box office reporting on in the eighties for like small movies can be yeah. kind of iffy, especially like in terms of budget reporting as well. But if this movie made like sixteen million dollars on a quarter million dollar budget, this is one of the most ridiculously profitable movies ever. Yeah. Um, it's currently owned by Troma, but Troma didn't make it. No, but it fits into, like, I saw it originally as a Troma released DVD, and I totally believe they did. Yeah. It's just a little bit too old for what they were doing at that time. Yeah. So, yeah, I like that one. Uh, that brings us to one of the best, uh, The Burning, directed by Tony Malem. Uh, Tony Malum's only other movie I could had ever seen that he made was Split Second, which is a kind of fun B sci-fi action movie with Rutger Hauer. May he rest in peace. I think this might be my favorite summer camp slasher movie, uh, other than maybe Friday Part Six, mm-hmm. which actually has fucking summer camp, like they're actual children. <laughs> but this one has more of that whole vibe of teenagers at summer I camp. I think this one has the kids as well. They're just they just cast everyone the same age. Yeah, yeah. You have no idea how I. This is one of those movies that's great where I cannot tell the difference between the campers and the. Uh, the counselors is set for two. There's two people who are clearly counselors and everyone else. I, 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 Jennifer, or Jason Alexander and Fisher Stevens 
both look old enough to be uh, counselors in this one. Um, and they're both and Holly Hunter's in this one. She has like no lines. I think she cries once. I think all the main characters in this are the counselors. And then all the characters, they get one to zero lines are the campers. Do you think so? Okay, because I'm honestly not sure, because I swear there's scenes where people are bossing around Fisher Stevens and Jason Alexander as if they're counselors, but maybe they're just the in-charge counselors. Yeah, it, there's a whole hierarchy. It's okay. like the bureaucracy <laughs> of summer camps. You don't even want to get into it. I don't even, I've only ever gone to the Jewish Community Center camp, and uh, that's not even, you don't even stay overnight there. No. You just go make arts and crafts and get free challah bread. But yeah, I mean, this might be the most uh, future famous people. Like, it doesn't just have one Kevin Bacon or one Jennifer Jason Lee. It has three future pretty big time. One Oscar win, two Oscar winners. Fisher Stevens has an Oscar for production, mm-hmm. uh, and a Jason Alexander, who is very good and deserves an Emmy. Yeah, and you know <laughs> what? George, I don't know if he ever got one, but he deserved uh, it. He probably did. I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. Uh, but he's very good in this, and he's charming in this. Yeah, which is saying something because he's known for non-charming characters. The uh, the uh, <laughs> sort of jokester slasher movie character archetype is a fraught sort of role that can either be the thing that uh, lifts up a movie and makes it very fun and watchable, or the thing that makes you just like fuck. I hate these people. Just kill them already. Yeah. Um, and I think Jason Alexander in this does a really great job. Actually, I think the guy from Halloween 2, the red-headed guy, he also yeah. is very good. Yeah. Um, but He's Jason Alexander that... is is very charming in this. Jason Alexander's great. Fisher Stevens is good in the role. He's not a standout, but he's very well cast. He's one of the more believable, uh, lanky teenagers. Um, this is the I... first, uh, first movie that slasher movie that the Weinsteins were involved in before they made Scream. I think there's like no slasher movies in between this and Scream. Yeah, so they have a well, fantastic record as far as that goes. Well, and also there, this movie kind of uh, uh, rose um, the Weinsteins to prominence. This made them quite a bit of money Yeah, and gave them some clout. Um, you can thank and, Sex, Lies, and Videotape uh, yeah. from The Burning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, you could probably draw that direct line there. Um, and then at that point, they, they kind of blow up as a big deal. And so you can also blame this movie. Yes, for the absolutely. Things. This is terrible. And Tom Savini should be ashamed. Um, we always said these were misogynists. We just didn't know the route it took to get there. It was a long. Yeah, yeah it was a roundabout. Um, I I've always feel really bad for the one girl who dies after having sex with the guy who's sort of the bully but turns out to be a sort of nice guy. The thing about this movie that is interesting is it cares more about the campers than obviously the the trope of the slasher movie full of assholes who you're rooting for their deaths. That yeah. came later when it was clear that the breakout stars of these slasher movies were Michael Myers, Jason and Freddy. Yeah. Um so that it's not doesn't it hasn't popped up as much in these 1981 films. You have the the stray sort of you know jerk who is you know just causing drama and stuff because you need to do something before the people get killed. But this movie in particular, really, you really care about the characters. There's a scene where everyone realizes that has often in slasher movies the scene where it's like oh my god everyone around me has been being killed it happens to a single person who has kind of a breakdown and then has to sort of rally and fight the killer this time it happens to like a whole island full of people and there's just a shot a tracking shot of everyone losing their minds crying about yeah about like oh my god we're gonna die this is so messed up and i love it there's never been a scene like that in any other slasher movie where it's like no this is a disaster. You would have a full-on emotional breakdown if you were in this situation. Uh, this is one that in uh, Men, Women, and Chainsaws, uh, the author says this is a, a prime example of the final girl actually being a boy who is coded as not male, mm-hmm. like as less male is the way she describes it, uh, Carol Clover describes it. And she says that he essentially fills the same role in the film. There's other stuff in this book. It's an older book, so there's some problematic gender politics attached to the book. But I do find this idea interesting, uh, which is going to come up again in just a little bit here, of the certain uh, character stereotypes. Uh, They can be male or female, but it's just about masculine versus feminine more than male versus female, I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
But um, yeah, this is a great movie. This Tom is Savini. my favorite Tom Savini effects of this era. I love the finger cutting. Uh, this is one of my favorite backstories for the killer because, you know, he got a bum, you know, and it doesn't have any transphobic undercurrent. Like, yeah. Terror Train also has a spectacular opening scene, but it's super, like, problematic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> At, by the end of the movie. By the time uh, you finish Terror Train, it's hard to have a good feeling in 2019. Right, right. But there is still, a, anyway. Um, and uh, I think uh, we'll come back to this, but this movie was originally entitled Cropsy after the killer. Mm-hmm. But it isn't actually based on the urban legend of Cropsy, which is a New York style boogeyman. It's it only based of... in that uh, I think the Weinstein's came from New York and they had right. heard it, so they took the name from it. And at some point, it was discovered that director Joe uh, Gianni Giannone Giannone I can't do Italian names. You know, that. if you're going to keep doing this podcast, you better learn. Giannone. You better get some uh, Duolingo or something. I know. Uh, maybe I'll just use robot uh, voices. Um, anyway, he was also ma- making a slasher film that was actually based on the Cropsey legend. Um, and it was figured out because an actor trying out for one movie had a girlfriend who said, oh, there's this other movie I tried out for that has a guy named Cropsey. And so uh, that movie had its name changed to Madman. Uh, Which... and it was, And it was actually put on hold because it was agreed between Giano and the Weinsteins that that uh, I guess the public couldn't handle two uh, Cropsey themed movies, even though one of them wasn't even Cropsey themed. And I've read between the lines that the uh, Weinsteins somehow threatened him. Yeah, there's no, there's nothing written about that. But we, knowing what we know about the Weinsteins, I'm sure they somehow threatened him. And because of that, Mad Men was not actually released wide until '83. And apparently, like. You know, the Weinsteins were still the Weinsteins even in 1981 because the director has talked about, like, hearing two different demands from both the Weinstein brothers while on the set and, like, how just a much of a nightmare it was to shoot because they just wanted so much input and they were just monkeying around with it so much. Yeah, so, anyway. Weinstein's gonna Weinstein. Uh, Uh, That actually has implications now. I did not. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we can't say. Sorry about that. You can't even like complain about them anymore because it turned out so much worse than we all assumed right Um, yeah like we were mad that they messed up hero it's like fuck off who cares about hero yeah that wasn't a problem now uh yeah yeah um okay that brings us to happy birthday to me uh which is probably better known for its cover art slash poster than it is actually as a movie of a man getting a shish kebab shoved into his mouth the this one's directed by jay lee thompson hell yeah the, kate fear <laughs> and the yeah the the it says virginia is a, is proud that she belongs to a clique the best students at a private school but before her 18th birthday a grueling set of murders takes place and her friends are the ones who are falling prey could it be her she sh- she suffers from blackouts during a freak accident one year earlier we soon learn soon learn the truth behind her accident and what's going on that's a decent coverage of the thing yeah I, I guess I forgot. This is another big name director. Gums of Navarone and Cape Fear. So you have one directed by the director of Chichi Bang Bang, and you have another one directed by Guns of Navarone and Cape Fear. Um again, also a guy who apparently wanted to do this. Uh it 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 pays. Like this movie is well directed. I did not get a chance yeah. to rewatch this for this show, but I have seen it in the past and I'm a big fan. Uh there's a funny thing you realize it tries to cover the fact that it's Canadian, but you realize it's Canadian because the big important game at the at this this school is a soccer game and not a football or basketball game. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> I was like, wait, why is it a soccer game? Who gives a shit about soccer in the 80s? And Amer- oh, it's Canadian. Uh, there we are. The filmmakers readily admit to making it birthday theme because it was a, quote, holiday that hadn't been made into a slasher yet not knowing Bloody Birthday was going to beat them to theaters. Apparently, yeah, the director had a good time, but uh, Glenn Ford was miserable and shitty to everyone and punched an AD uh, and had to be, like, walked off set and he was known for locking himself in his his trailer and stuff. So did not pay off to get an older actor uh, at a cheap price. Though, I don't know what your book says, but I 
read that this cost three million dollars. Yes, this was. Hold on, I can pull it up in a second. But yeah, that that this that's a lot of money. I think you. It it looks pricier than a lot of these movies. Yeah, there are car still. stunts in the beginning. It's long. It's yeah, not that's just true. like a quick eighty minute sort of a slasher movie. Yeah, the, there's a thing that happens twice in the movie where there's a drawbridge in town and teens are jumping over it. And it's a pretty spectacular stunt. And then later in the movie, we have a flashback where someone doesn't make it over and falls in the water. So that's two cars you destroyed and you had to shut down that road and get permission to use this uh, this uh, drawbridge and get good enough stunt performers that knew how to know what they were doing. And there, there's a weird thing about the drawbridge stunt that the, these teens are so toxically masculine that they t- that one destroys his car for a $20 bet because he's being called chicken. He just ruins his car. <laughs> but the bet was only $20 that he would uh, be too chicken to jump the thing. I recall really liking the characters of this film. Um, well, this is one of those movies that has unlikable, well-done characters. I, I think, think that's what I... It's, yeah, I like the actors. I like, I like the yes. performances. They're rich assholes to the nth degree. Like, this is one that, that doesn't fuck around with... Uh, a lot of these movies have this implication that these are kind of rich kids, that these are like well-to-do kids. Like, and they're almost always white kids, and they're almost always at either a nice school, like a like a some sort of special school, or they're at a summer school thing that probably wasn't cheap. Um, this one goes out of its way to say that these people are bad because they are spoiled rich kids. It uh, it's a college campus slasher. This is like if you wanted to find a college campus slasher, I think this is a good. Uh, one to show to someone who's never seen and doesn't understand what you mean by that. Um, there's one murder that is just a backseat strangling from Halloween. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a really good murder that with the weight in the weight room. Yeah, there's a great weight room murder, which is uh, you've seen similar murders in other movies, but I think this is probably the best version of that. Yeah, um, at least until um, Tragedy Girls which is a film that came out a year ago or two years ago, and I highly recommend it. Oh, I haven't people. seen that one. I haven't seen that one. Great. So. If you like Scream and you want to see, like, a, sort of a postmodern take on a slasher movie that isn't necessarily just, like, full-on shitty, like, we know we're doing the tropes, like, Tragedy Girls yeah. is great. I think I was confusing it with Final Girls, which I did see. Yeah, I do not like that which was also, at all. It was okay. It was well... Uh, I, oh, that one was fine. I don't remember a lot about it, but it was okay. Um... This also has this uh, giallo thing going on where it has pseudoscience playing a role in the plot and that it also has no good and then repressed memories being tied to that pseudoscience. A lot of post Dario Argento movies had some sort of dumb scientific thing that uh, doesn't do much, but that the authorities are are tying to the crimes. Uh, and there's this funny thing where this girl... Uh, has, the, the girl has repressed memories and no one is helping her work through these memories for some reason, including her psychologist and her her brain surgeon. <laughs> They're like keeping all she needs to do is hear that she was part of this accident where her mom died. But for some reason, people are keeping it secret, including her dad. And so it has that thing where you sort of suspect the dad is the killer because he's keeping secrets from his daughter. It's also and... probably the longest slasher movie until Scream 2. Yeah, it's pretty long, and it feels pretty long. Um, I've heard that there are MPAA cuts on this one. Yes. Um, and it was an ad campaign with six of the most bizarre murders you will ever see, and I would not say that they are, um, but it was kind of a cool ad campaign. But there is the brain surgery uh, flashback is really gross, like something you'd see in reanimator gross. Mm-hmm. Um and then, yeah, like I mentioned, this essentially has the same ending as Madhouse. Um, but the twist is in this one is that there are there's a doppelganger who's not really a doppelganger, um, whereas in Madhouse, they're actual twins. And, and I have suspected that the dead mom and the dad being weird about the dead mom was and the killer's uh, motive, actually were all a maybe influential on Scream, that that might have been where Kevin Williamson got kind of his, that stuff from Scream. Yeah, right okay, yeah, I can see it. And it's possible. I don't know exactly which movies was, were the influences there, but 
Uh, that brings us to The Fan, which is another studio picture directed by Ed Bianchi. Not quite a slasher movie. No, not really. Um, this is definitely a studio thriller that realized slasher movies were getting popular and tried to add a little bit of that to the mix. Uh, the plot is a record store clerk is an uh, obsessive fan of an actress of stage and screen. However, when his letters are rejected, the fan strikes out at the actress's friends and then her. Uh, Ed Bianchi didn't make a lot of movies, but he made some of the best television you've ever seen, including Deadwood, The Wire, Mad Men, Boardwalk Empire, which isn't that great but looks great, and The Get Down. Uh, they, uh, I, I, I honestly wonder if this was set out to be a kind of Hitchcock or De, by way of De Palma, so like a a second degree. It was it, they're mimicking De Palma, mimicking Hitchcock, basically. Um, and I think it probably started that way, and then they made the the scenes a little more violent. Um, it looks nice, and, it, and the thing is, is this is probably the biggest. Lauren Bacall was almost definitely the biggest star in any of these movies that we're going to cover. Um, but she was on the tail end of her career at this point. She re- she retired from screen acting and did mostly voice work after not too long after this. But this does have a pre-Terminator Michael Bean. And James Garner is in a small role. Maureen Stapleton's in a small role. Hector Lozano is in a small role. Uh, Griffin Dunn is in a really small role. Um, and Dana Delaney is in a really small role, too. And it's sort of... I, I, I get a feeling that it started as Sunset Boulevard... Um, but the killer, but the, the, the younger male protagonist is a killer rather than just a, like, it has a Sunset Boulevard thing where Bacall's character is, is in the sunset of her, uh, career, but it kind of pulls away from that because she's about to have a very, a very big deal, uh, musical is what she's preparing for the whole movie. And so a lot of the movie is devoted to this musical and the production of this musical to the point where you could probably delete uh, Michael Bean entirely from the film and you would still have almost an hour's worth of film about an actress trying to get her, you know, third wind with this big expensive musical. This and is, uh, her- this is again, uh, relevant as uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is now in theaters. It's, again, I I don't see movies, Patrick. I don't know how I don't know from movies. Well, that is I'm not I'm not spoiling anything by saying that is what Leonardo DiCaprio's character is primarily concerned with. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, yes. On the tail end of his career, and all, and like just large amounts of time being spent on the nitty gritty of that. Yeah. Um. Apparently, the producer of the film was known for musicals uh, and musical infused movies, so that's why it's like this. It's hilarious because the musical is awful. Yeah. It's really bad. And and really and I feel I feel I feel bad saying this, but Bacall's singing is atrocious. Well, she yeah, that I mean, yeah, she's not known as a singer. No, and so I don't understand why they built this role around her singing skill and then didn't dub her or or anything. Like it's it it's and so there's like at the end of the movie when she does her play or her musical and she sings and just she gets a standing ovation for this just terrible singing but she's otherwise very very good um she takes it seriously she enjoys it apparently she hated the movie after the fact and apparently it was very controversial not because Bacall was in a slasher movie but because it was released very close to john lennon's murder ah uh, um, well yeah and so people didn't like the uh idea of that um i think the movie falls apart because it a lot of the time feels like what if what if we had a version of taxi driver where the anti-villain character the the travis bickle character was super handsome because there's a lot of like look how attractive there's there's a really weird scene that is maybe the most r-rated film mo- uh, scene in the movie where he goes to uh he's realizes he's been found out and he wants to fake his own death so he goes to a gay bar and picks up a guy and takes him to a back alley or no not a back alley but a uh, uh the roof of a building and uh and in the middle of getting a blowjob, and it is it is implied that he is getting a blowjob and enjoying it, he uh, cuts the guy's throat and then pours gasoline on the body and burns it, leaves a suicide note, hoping that the police will assume it's him. Jesus. 
And so I was first kind of shocked at how graphic this scene was in this otherwise not very graphic movie. For instance, he doesn't actually kill a lot of people. He mostly just attacks people. And it's kind of shocking that they don't just identify him because he's not wearing a mask or anything. Um, But as soon as I got over the shock, I realized that's almost what happens in Dario Gento's opera. That's also about an obsessive guy um, stalking a uh, opera star instead of a musical star. And that he fakes his own death by lighting a mannequin on fire. And so I do wonder, I could imagine Dario Argento watching this movie, honestly. Um, sure, I mean, this is, maybe... it's not well remembered now, but at the time, I'm sure it got a wider release than most. And you'd, and you'd be surprised how many movies end up being popular in Italy for some re- weird reason. Um, and the opening scenes are uh, reminiscent of deep red and that they are massive close-ups on just various objects on uh michael bean's desk and then it also has a pino uh denagio uh score which i could imagine attracting someone like oh sure sure um my favorite thing was the record store apparently the only songs they could get the rights to to use in the record store scenes were uh two-tone records songs uh by the specials and the selector and as a fan of 80s british ska i was very happy about that myself <laughs> uh, I, we'll talk about that more later when we get to just before dawn some of the songs that pop up in these movies just blows my mind <laughs> yeah final exam um, so, i don't know if is a movie worth talking that much about people like it and i don't really know why yeah uh it's by jimmy houston who is not related to the famous houston's uh, uh jack and uh angelica etc uh, a small college town in North Carolina, only a select few students are left to take midterms. But when a killer strikes, it could be everyone's final exam. And that really is the movie. Um, the I, One thing I'll say about it is it is, a, it is a prank slasher movie. There is a small thing where graduation day has a bit of that um, splatter university... And especially the dorm that did, the dorm that dripped blood, which is also known as pranks, have this prank slasher thing going on where there's like a, uh, uh, idea that 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 pranks have become too violent kind of thing. This is um, uh, a North Carolina um, slasher college slasher movie, and uh, by all accounts, it was a big influence on um, Kevin Williamson when he wrote Scream Two. It certainly steals the scene where the kid is tied up for giving his ring uh, to the girl. Oh, yeah. And then later gets killed because he's all tied up. Um, That is just lifted verbatim uh, for Scream 2. Um, It has a weird uh, Black Christmas sort of a thing where the killers never explained who they are or why it's happening. Yeah, he's just a guy. Um, And there's no mask or hiding the identity. He's he's got this page boy haircut like... um... Ch- Anton Chigurh in uh, No Country for Old Men. It's a thing where, like, <laughs> it would be disturbing um, if done correctly, but yeah. it's just not quite done correctly. So instead, instead, it kind of deflates everything because you're just like, oh, it's just a guy. It's just like he's not scary in any way. And, uh, and his final showdown with the final girl is just this never-ending, boring, yeah, trip up the stairs. It's. There, there are, I think, two things worth talking about. One is uh, the character of Radish. Yeah. Portrayed by Joel S. Rice. Um, who, um, not a gay man, but yeah. the character, I think, is gay. Well, he's obsessed with the girl, but it might be performative. I think he's gay, too. Um, and I really want him to be the, quote, final girl. Yeah. But he he dies and it actually and it deflates the movie again. That's another thing that deflates the movie is that this really likable effeminate man uh, who it seems like he's going to be one thing that is interesting about this movie is just sort of killed like everyone else. I And he is sort of the entry point to, I think, why the killer is who it is, which is he's sort of there's a brief scene in the beginning where he's talking about Charles Whitman and he has this weird admiration and he's in awe of Charles Whitman, the uh, the sniper who shot people in the tower and I forget what Texas university, but that was the seventies. So this is not that much long later. And so I think this is trying to be a similar thing where it's just sort of like sometimes random violence happens for no reason at all. And isn't that what's scary? Yeah. But they just can't quite get. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, the other thing I think we're talking about is that there's this one sequence that I think would have played a lot different in 1981. <laughs> yes, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> where a black van pulls up and people in ski masks jump out with assault rifles and open fire and they seemingly they kill a bunch of people and kidnap some other ones. And a bunch of people and a, 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 the other kids are sitting around uh, confused, like, what is this horrible, violent terrorist attack? Um, but very quickly, two girls notice that the van belongs to, like, this this fraternity and that it was an, a very elaborate prank. And the authorities even chide Radish for bothering to call them <laughs> about this staged about this mass armed shooting. attack. And, and he, they're like, yes, this wasn't even. Fa-. And then and then nobody talks about it like ever again throughout the entire. Yeah, because, of course, it's ridiculous thinking about a mass shooting happening on it. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It, but so this scene is just it's jaw dropping in its. Uh, uh, n- I'm, I don't know how to, I don't know what other words to say. It's just jaw dropping because it's it's. It would not work ever again. It's offensive. Like that would be, <laughs> let's, that would let's, be the I know center. we're afraid to say the word offensive because we're people who watch exploitation movies all day. But like, <laughs> it is like you watch it, you're like, oh, gross. Yeah. But I don't think I would have found it offensive even being myself, my sensitive self in 1981. No, it's true. I think I just, it's just, it wouldn't have had the same uh, connotation. Uh, not even 10 years later. Or no, I guess I don't remember when Columbine happened. Ninety eight, nine, ninety eight. Yeah, ninety eight. Uh, uh, yeah, so it wouldn't be too much longer, but yeah, it still wouldn't have the same connotation for a while. Anyway, I think it's a boring movie. It is. Um, I don't think the kills are particularly good, so I don't know. I would skip. You know it what is not answer. a boring movie? Road games. Road games. <laughs> Road games directed by Richard Franklin, who uh, got the gig directing Psycho Two because they the producers like this movie so much uh, a truck driver plays cat and mouse game with a mysterious serial killer who uses young female hitchhiker as bait to lure his victim uh, to lure victims on a desolate australian highway uh not not exactly a slasher movie no no really not uh it's rear window meets duel a, it's a brilliant premise the idea of rear window on the highway is like yeah if you pitch that to me i would say what do you mean what does that even mean yeah. but it makes a lot of sense the way they play it yeah um there are a couple references to psycho and north by northwest and christine pointed out that there is a it happened one night gag and i had totally missed that and i didn't mark down what it was but apparently there's a happen one is night it is it like too. there's the wall in between the bed Yep, that's it. That was yeah, the, the walls of Jericho. Yeah, the walls of Jericho. Um, it's the second rear window movie on here, and the much better mm-hmm. one. Uh, and uh, it's our first uh, Oz exploitation movie, though it was made by an Australian crew in Australia. The leads are Stacy Keach and uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, um, and the director's not and Australian. I, and the director's not Australian, so it, it really feels like an American. Uh, medium budget, uh, not even exploitation film, but an American medium budget thriller that was shot in Australia. Yeah, I mean, and, and that is the premise of the movie is too, is like part of the isolation the character feels is that he is a foreigner and therefore he yeah. doesn't necessarily know the customs and people don't trust him. And like, that's why he knows there's a serial killer operating on this highway, but he just can't get anyone to believe him. And it's not an incidentally Australian movie either. There's a really interesting scene, uh, I think, where he stops in a roadside diner, and it's a scene. It's almost a, it's similar to a scene in a, a duel, but he stops at the roadside diner. Yeah, to yeah, call yeah. The, the authorities, and not only are none of the people in the diner trusting of him because of his American accent, but the camera pans around the diner, and the diner has a mural of of uh, the British enslaving the Aboriginals. Mm-hmm like as a decorative element and it's like like here's a it's the equivalent it's like of it's, like a confederate flag if this was happening yeah. in the south right and so it's giving us it's giving us i think really vital uh uh thematic substance without spelling it out for us um and the thing that makes this movie work is that stacy keach is interesting enough to be with for 45 minutes of runtime of talking like to himself alone 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's really good in that. I mean, Jamie Lee Curtis was sort of at her peak. Um, I feel like this through like uh, a fish called Wanda, she is just like the most charming person yeah. who is like, oh, you could have had a massive career in the 40s. Like you could have been uh, like a comedic lead in the 40s and 50s. Uh, you could have not necessarily had Debbie Reynolds career. Uh, not yeah, Debbie Reynolds is her mom. Not necessarily have her career because no, Denny wrote Denny. What am I talking it's about? That's Carrie, Carrie Fisher's, Fisher's mom. mom. Her her mom is to, her dad is Tony Curtis. At any rate, yeah. her mom is Janet Lee. Same yes. difference. Could have. You know what though? She might have a better career than Janet Lee overall. No, oh no, that's say. without question. <laughs> but yeah, it was sold as a slasher movie in part because she was in it and she was still coming off of Halloween mm-hmm. and Prom Night and Terror Train. At that oh point. yeah, yeah. Um, but um, it's not a slasher movie. There's one scene at the very beginning of the uh the killer killing somebody um it's the only scene with any real violence and it's still implied uh and it is the only scene with any nudity and it's mostly implied i feel like this is a pg-13 movie before the pg-13 rating yeah there's a there's a there's a moment of implication that is gross um when he realizes that the weight of his truck is a little different yes which is a very Hitchcock thing. Oh. I think that a lot of people say this movie's Hitchcock like because it had suspense, but no, having an extra piece of meat maybe be in your meat and also the fact that it's a meat wagon, literal meat wagon, yeah. uh is is a Hitchcock joke. But yeah, all- there's an extra I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, but there's like extra weight and he thinks maybe there's an extra slab of meat and he thinks maybe the killer put one of the bodies in there, but he doesn't know. Um, and also, like, the idea of, like, Hitchcock's sense of humor being uh, implying something horrific but not outright saying it and therefore getting away with it. Um, yeah. I think the thing – like, we're going to talk about uh, Blowout next, and I am not a De Palma fan. Um, and I think yeah. the thing that always gets to me about De Palma's movies that this is sort of a good antidote to and a good counterpoint to is that – De Palma's movies are obsessive about referencing Hitchcock and about stealing shots from Hitchcock and stuff like that. But the thing about yes. Hitchcock movies is they all have great scripts with very charming actors and great dialogue, and they're super well-paced and plotted, and that is what makes yes. them Hitchcock movies. And De Palma's scripts are almost uniformly really dumb. Yeah. Um, and this movie is the sort of Hitchcock love letter – that also has the witty banter of a 39 steps or the lady vanishes sort of a thing where the two unlikely, uh, yeah, the women and the male and female leads sort of get together and form an unlikely friendship and budding romance, uh, as they try to solve. I actually, I, I enjoy that their relationship is so platonic. I think that's makes it even more charming. Honestly, I mean, I think, that I think there is a romantic implication, but it's not, Forceful, no, and and know? that is and that's true of Hitch, a lot of the Hitchcock movies as well. Is that yeah. they're they're intellectual equals, um, and it's only at the end that they sort of kiss. And this one, I think they don't even kiss. No, either. they do not. They're this one uh, plays it even more straight uh, as far as it being platonic. But I really like this movie a lot. I think yep. the second half, the pacing kind of gets a little wonky. It's not yeah. it's not quite like I love everything in the first forty five minutes or so. Um, I love Jamie Lee Curtis and Stacey Keach in this. Um, I think once Jamie Lee Curtis leaves the movie for a while, that's when it starts to not quite know what to do, um, how to wrap things up. But it's a great, amazing script. The and Richard Franklin does an incredible job with it. I really, it's not a slasher movie, but uh, I, I can see why it gets listed, and I, I enjoyed watching it for the first time for this uh, episode, nonetheless. Yeah. It's good. It's a good movie. Highly recommended. Uh, it just got announced. Uh, Scream Factory is going to be putting it out in its first U.S. Blu-ray. Cool. Uh, just just right after I bought the uh, region free umbrella Blu-ray, uh, which is yeah, which will, it's good as probably well. Look the same. They'll look the same. I, I, I'm sure that they're working from the same transfer. But and there's a lot um, of special anyway. features on that Blu-ray as well. So if you want to get yeah, that one, they might even recycle them. Scream Factory yeah. is not the type to to not recycle. Um, so yeah, that brings us to Blowout, which is a movie I know isn't a slasher movie and I didn't even see another list, but I wanted to include it just because it was a Hollywood movie that 
uh, referenced slasher movies at a time when slasher movies were still pretty new. And it opens like a fake slasher movie. It's directed by Brian De Palma. The plot is Jack Terry is a master sound recordist who works on grade B horror movies. Late one evening, he is recording sounds for use in his movies when he hears something unexpected through his sound equipment and records it. Curiosity gets the better of him uh, when the media becomes involved and he begins to unravel a piece of a, of a nefarious uh, conspiracy. As he struggles to survive against his shadowy enemies and expose the truth, he does not know whom he can trust. Uh, this is uh, basically uh, partway between uh, Michelangelo Antonioni's uh, Blow Up and uh, Francis Ford Coppola's The Conversation. Yes. Um, both of which are better movies, but I actually really like this movie. This is probably my second favorite De Palma thriller uh, behind Sisters and maybe my fourth favorite De Palma movie behind Carrie Sisters and Fan of the Paradise. In fact, those four movies... Uh, if you would tell me what De Palma movies should I see, I would tell you those four yeah. movies. And I, I like I would some add of the other Mission ones, Impossible, but, but um, yeah, maybe and maybe Carlito's Way. And like I understand, you know, Scarface is a movie I think people should see. I'm not a huge fan of it, but I think it is a movie to understand the '80s kind of situation. Uh, which he actually made that after this. Um, this was. Made in the wake of uh, Dress to Kill, which is a movie some people might be surprised to hear I kind of hate. I don't like Dress to Kill. I think it's uh, really gross and weird, and I don't like the characters. I don't like what it has to say. I don't like the way it's made. I think this is the better version of let's do some Hitchcock-like stuff, but it still feels like Brian De Palma's name, you know, his stamp is on it. I think the characters are much more interesting, though... I think uh, Nancy Allen is miscast, but I kind of think she's always miscast. Yeah, um, I, it, it, there's a weird thing in this movie where every scene that she's in is about how dumb and naive she is. Yeah. And then at the end, they're like trying to play it like, oh, my God, I can't believe she died. You cared so much about her. And it's like, no, you've just been making fun of her this whole movie. What do you? <laughs> and I've always been a little bothered by the fact that she and De Palma were an item during the one two punch of uh, this movie and Dress to Kill. It's just something. The way he like the up. way he those <laughs> characters come off is just like yeah, as dumb prostitutes basically yeah. is is all they are. Um, anyway, uh, I, this to me though, like Road Games, and the reason why I think this is better than a lot of his other sort of uh, wannabe Hitchcock movies is this movie is a genuinely smart, fascinating idea of a way of taking a different movie's ideas and recontextualizing them like the political thriller version of blow up uh with the sound recording and everything is like uh-huh. it's really cool and and it's interesting because both blow up and the the conversation don't give us answers in the yeah. end um this one gives us answers in the end but might actually be the most depressing ending of all three they all have different degrees of de- well i guess blow up isn't a depressing ending as much as a purposefully uh uh misleading ending like, like it's not it's purposely not giving us what we want uh and then conversation is purposefully depressing but then this one is just like a huge bummer to the point where it's almost a comedic level bummer yeah um it, it, i don't know if i think the tone of that that final reveal works for me i think it's it was it was something that apparently critics really hated at the time. Well, if you're watching he... if you're watching this movie and you're still trying to think of it as something taking place in the real world as opposed to watching it as part of the De Palma filmography and De Palma Land and like his own cult following, like yeah. the idea of that sound recording being in that movie is absolutely ludicrous. I guess what we're yeah so uh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> I go, we have to spoil this to explain what we're saying uh, if you haven't seen the movie. I feel like if you're uh, the kind of film dork who is listening to Genre Grinder, you probably have seen this film. Okay, well, yeah, we'll just leave it at that then. Um, and I think John Lithgow is a fabulous killer in this movie. Uh, I, I, and I think that he's genuinely frightening, and I think that that's one element that sort of works as and a that, slasher. Yeah, and that is the slasher subplot that sort of happens in the background that I always forget about exists. And then when you like put it on your list, I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Because I forgot about that yeah. John Lithgow subplot. There's just that opening scene, and then there's the John Lithgow stuff. Club, which you could kind of remove. He's just sort of an assassin. In a normal movie, he would be uh, 
off screen with like a gun and he wouldn't even be a major character, but instead he's this basically slasher killer guy. Um, anyway, yeah, I like this movie a lot. And, uh, I really I'm, like this movie until the third act. And then I'm like, Oh, yeah. it's De Palma. This is stupid. I can't. Well, and impressive. I think that says something that we both like this and you don't really like De Palma. And I'm about half and half on De Palma. Yeah. I think that that really says something about how good it is. The next, uh, next, the next film is the, uh, it's, it's such a milestone. I can't believe it took until 1981. Uh, the first horror <laughs> comedy ever made. Uh, yeah. Cause I guess Roger Corman does not exist. Yeah. Or, or like James whale. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say the invisible man. <laughs> Uh, this is Student Bodies by Mickey Rose. It is the first official slasher um, parody, and it is, in fact, a slasher parody. Oh, yeah. I don't really like spoof movies in general. I don't even really like Airplane. It's just not a thing I like. Uh-huh. Um, but this one is a low-budget airplane for slasher movies. Um, and they even do a heavy-breathing uh, phone gag that you then would see in the scary movie franchise and there's one good joke where it is essentially a pg rated movie and they cut in the middle of the film to a man sitting behind a desk that talks directly to the audience and says that he has just gotten word that r-rated films sell better and so he looks in the camera and says fuck you and then it goes back to the movie (laughs) (laughs) i have not seen this movie that's pretty good it's a genuinely the reason why this movie has an R rating is because of that. And not after that um, point, it doesn't then start doing R rated stuff. It stays pretty PG. Yeah, it's never violent. There's no nudity. Wow, um, that's that's it actually has a, brave. Yeah, it has a slightly interesting backstory where uh, it it says it was directed by Mickey Rose, but Mickey Rose was really the writer. And as part of a WGA, uh, uh, Writers Guild of America deal, where there was some sort of uh, strike at the time, director, producer, Michael Ritchie had his name removed. Huh. So it's really directed by Michael Ritchie. And Michael Ritchie is known for Bad News Bears and the Fletch movies. So it does have a little bit of Fletch to it, but no, none of that money. Uh, and it also has an enormous amount of Dr. Pepper product placement, which I was never sure if that was supposed to be a joke or not. Um, anyway, uh, I, not, not my kind of thing, but it is genuinely a slasher parody, which will come up again in a little bit here, uh, which brings us to Deadly Blessing, directed by Wes Craven. After her husband dies of mysterious circumstances, a widow becomes increasingly paranoid of the neighborhood of the neighboring religious community that may have diabolical plans for her. Uh, you said you only saw this in a... Hayes? Yes, it was part of a 24-hour horror film festival at like 3 a.m. and I was passing in and out. So I saw um, uh, what's it? I saw Ernest Borgnine's big fake beard, and I had a mm. dream about his beard like wrapping around his neck like a snake. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's more interesting than anything that happens in this movie. And there's a snake in this movie as well, if I recall. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, there is because. It gets put in a. It's it's basically Wes Craven doing a version of the Nightmare on Elm Street bathtub scene, but with a snake instead of a. This dog. is uh this is the dead zone of Wes Craven's career when it was like yes. oh yeah I guess that guy who uh, he made a bit of a splash being a total creep, but I guess his career's done. It was it's interesting because uh, it feels like it was a made for TV movie, and half his movies from the six year period between Hills Have Eyes and Nightmare on Elm Street were made for TV movies. But this one wasn't. It just has that feel. It just feels like it. And I wonder if maybe it was going to be because it's not that violent. It has a couple of violent scenes that didn't really need to be in the movie, but it feels like a made for TV movie. It's definitely Wes Craven getting up to his slickness. Uh-huh. Like, you know, like Last House and Left and, and Hills Have Eyes both look like they were shot in, in a, you know, a dust storm. Uh, they're they're grimy movies and you know you get up to nightmare on elm street and by the time you're to scream Wes craven's like mr slick uh as far as horror movies go um so it has some of that uh it has an interesting idea that it's an amish themed horror movie uh though they didn't want to offend the amish so they're calling them uh hittites uh which is in true Wes craven form a historical reference like uh, the the Shawnee Bean family, sure. Know, and Hills Have Eyes. Um, 
It's yeah, it's a good idea and it looks nice, but it's really awkward and it has some of those there's this really awful performances that Wes Craven can get out of people. <laughs> sometimes he gets really good performances out of people and sometimes he just gets the worst performances and I don't know what that's about. Um Sharon Stone is a uh, young Sharon Stone's in this and she's okay. She's a minor character. Um, and Susan Bruckner and Lois uh, Nettleton are bigger characters and they're pretty good. But, you know, otherwise, even Michael uh, Berryman is kind of awful in this. Uh, the, the, well, the other interesting fact about this movie, I will say, is that Wes Craven down the line, I want to say years later, um, would end up divorcing his wife um, and he, there, this has only ever been spoken in hints and allegations. Um, but apparently uh-huh. his wife had an affair with Sharon Stone and oh. he, him and Sharon Stone had some, had, uh, had some beef, uh, over that. And as you can imagine, um, yeah, so, well, that makes it, that makes me feel bad. Cause I kind of hate Sharon Stone. Cause the factoid I read was that they wanted a spider to crawl across her mouth and she demanded that they remove the spider's um uh fangs before they do it which basically means the spider has to die and that kind of pissed me yeah. off because it was a tarantula and i understand why people are afraid of tarantulas because i'm freaked out by most spiders but tarantulas are pretty harmless and they're kind of cute and i had friends that had them as pets as a kid so i was kind of pissed off yeah, i've heard that, that story thing. as well so but, anyway but fucking the fucking the director's wife is that's, that's a- that's kinda bad cool. form. I don't know if it. I don't. <laughs> what do you think it's cool? <laughs> I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, I. I don't. I don't think it happened while they were filming this or whatever. But I think oh, okay. his wife, who I think did some sort of production job on a lot of his early films. Um. Yeah. Uh. Anyway, that's how they met, and uh, that ha- that uh, is it- allegedly happened. It's one of those things that. People mm-hmm. don't talk about, uh, but have it has been al- al- it has been alleged enough by different sources that I am apt to believe it. Um, the way Craven describes it is he had discovered his marriage had been a lie. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's it. That's his official. So it's something. At any rate, uh, it's it's a bad. It is a slasher movie to a certain degree. It has some supernatural elements, but um, it's not a good slasher movie. Uh, uh, there's uh okay you you personally patrick has have told me that you think the good slasher movies are are um teen sex comedies that get interrupted by a mad that murderer. is my favorite form of it yeah well this is for about a third of the movie one of those weird amish romance novels <laughs> that I'm, is being interrupted i by apologize a i am not aware of these amish romance novels of which you speak oh oh you got it. Okay, you'd have to do a Google search after we're done here because this is this is a phenomenon uh, that uh, yeah you need to. Look okay, into I sh- I will look I was into this. Also, uh, and those at home listening can look into this as well. Oh yeah, it, it's a genre. They have like a whole like I don't know if there are any Barnes and Nobles left, but they have a whole section devoted to it. I, I stumbled across it one day, and I was amazed how many now i like slasher movies that have a rigid structure of a teen sex comedy that characters keep getting bumped off but no one knows so they can, the teen sex comedy happens and then eventually there's not enough characters to continue the story that's not the only structure i like for slasher movies no such as house by um, the cemetery which is a baffling yeah. <laughs> film and i adore it this is uh lucio Fulci, yeah uh who um I think this almost counts as a slasher movie. It's real close. It's awfully close. Uh, the uh, the best description you have on Letterboxd here is a deranged... Ki- oh. Well, shit. That's a spoiler, That's just too. the end. That's just the... Uh, I will say this. I saw House by the Cemetery and then remembered nothing about the twist at the end. or Because the plot was like, wait, you what know is what? happening? We have, to, we have to talk about yeah. the end. Uh, I, I'm going to describe it very quickly as... Uh, there is a, a, a person studying something or other has killed himself and a different professor and his family are asked to move into the same house to uh, research and uh, some bad shit starts going down. Uh, and uh, I just found out uh, I was going to do I was trying to say if any of these movies are called something else. I just found out that this movie is also known as The Revenge of the New York Ripper in uh, South Africa. Hell yeah. 
which makes me wish that there was some sort of Stephen King retcon bullshit uh, where the the duck voiced killer from uh, New York Ripper was somehow reincarnated as Dr. Freudstein, the zombie ish killer in House by the Hey, Sunset. we got compute. We got um, computers with microphones and we got a computer. We can we can redub some of this. We can make this work. That's a good point. That's a good point. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll try to, I wrote out a thing. I'm going to try, I tried to compact this because I love to talk about Fulci and you love this movie. Uh, House by the Cemetery is uh, Fulci's last great movie. And he still had a couple good ones after this, but this was the last great one. It was the last in his high point uh, of horror as well. Uh, it began with, uh, I wrote literal barn burner, uh, the uh, zombie, which was called zombie two in Italy and zombie flesh eaters in uh the uk which was supposed to be sort of a ripoff of dawn of the dead which became its own thing uh and after that made money internationally he was asked by other financiers and producers to make more stuff do whatever you want here's your money just make sure there's zombies in it so he made uh, a trilogy of really surrealistic uh, uh really violent zombie movies basically uh, the first one was City Living Dead, which uh, Patrick and I covered on one of his uh, tracks of the Check band. Check it out. The second was the, second was the Beyond, um, and the third was House by the Cemetery. Uh, some people call it the Gates of Hell trilogy. I've also heard it called the Zombie trilogy um, and the Gothic trilogy. And and in interviews, Fulci refers to it as the Arturi, uh, uh, Artudian horror trilogy. Um, Art, Artudian uh Arturian, I am really bad with French words. You think I'm bad with Italian words? Hi, this is Gabe. Real quick, I was so embarrassed by the way I pronounced that that I decided to redo that whole section real quick, real quick. Here, yeah, the dramatist was named Antoinon Atu or Atuad. I've seen it pronounced both ways. I've been told it's pronounced both ways, depending on whatever. I don't know. He was a French dramatist, poet, essayist, actor, and theater director, widely recognized as one of the major figures of the 20th century theater and of the European avant-garde. Uh, he is best known for the concept of the theater of cruelty, which is what Fulci was drawing upon. And he also considers all of these movies homages to H.P. Lovecraft. This one, I would say, is the weakest as far as that goes. They're also all three connected by British actress uh, Katriona McCall. Um, and a couple other actors appear between the three, but McCall is the lead in all three of them. And they all take place in American cities, the Beyond in New Orleans, City of the Living Dead in uh, Long Island, and the fictional town of Dunwich. And this movie takes place on the outskirts of Boston. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the odd picture out because it's not as surrealistic as the others, but and it's a little less supernatural but it's still not particularly logical. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it is plenty gross, even if it's not as out outrageously gross. It is really gory. And uh, the, the gore scenes are, um, at least a couple of them, sort of fashioned in a way that like slasher gore scenes are. Yep. Um, and it also has uh, it, other things it has in common. The City of Living Dead has a scene where a pickaxe is break, broken through a steel, uh, sealed coffin. And almost kills the uh, the uh, actress uh, who is McCall. Oh, right. This one has a version of that where a little boy is behind is stuck behind a door, and his dad's using an axe to try to break the door open, and the killer pushes the little boy's head against the wall, so he's almost getting hit by that. Um, this one was also very clearly inspired by The Shining. As far as, the little boy is sort of Fulci's version of Danny. Yeah. Torrance. There, uh, uh, the the go there's kind of like ghosts that are instead of in The Shining where the ghosts are trying to make uh, Jack Torrance do bad shit, these ghosts are trying to warn Danny Torrance away from the bad shit, is the best way to put it. So it's like the reverse of The Shining. Um, and then so yeah, I'll just spoil the ending of the movie is that that these people are in this house and and there's all these mysterious killings existing around the house, and it turns out that the original owner of the house, Doctor Freudstein has been living in the basement for decades and keeping himself alive by killing people and grafting their body parts onto his <laughs> own body. So he's his own Frankenstein. 100% medically accurate. And if you rewatch the movie, there's a really cool thing where um, at the beginning of the movie, he kills a woman, uh, Daniela Doria, um, who is in a lot of the Fulci movies as murder victims. 
and he drags her away. And as he's dragging her away, he has uh, one zombie hand and one adult man hand. And then in all the following scenes, he has one zombie hand and one woman's hand. Wow. <laughs> I feel like Fulci movies are full of little things that the movies are so hard to follow on a narrative level that I can never pick yeah. up on that sort of thing. Uh I did just find out the girl, the actress who plays the little girl claims that was her hand and not uh, 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 the uh, other actress. But still, it's a woman's or girl's Uh hand on one side, uh, which is a cool little touch, I think. So The Beyond Uh, is my favorite film of 1981. Uh, Yeah, my favorite film of 1981, flat out. Um, This, I don't think, matches up to that. But I do love this for a lot of the same reasons I love The Beyond and... uh, City of Living Dead. Yeah. If the, the camera, like, I feel like, in my mind, Dario Argento is the one who's known for having elaborate, sort of beautiful, striking colors and camera work and stuff, but the lighting in this movie is absolutely incredible. Um, especially, like, the nighttime scenes. There are just so many really strong highlights uh, on people, and, like, there's one particular shot of someone's throat getting slashed and blood sort of flowering out of it um in slow motion and the light hits it in such a way it's like legitimately it sounds ridiculous but it sounds it's like one of the most beautiful things i've seen in a movie like there's there's a lot of italian after, horror movies that don't make any sense or like feel irrational or ridiculous but they're they often feel haphazard in their filmmaking as well whereas fulci is an incredible filmmaker and i think that uh over the years i've come to learn the difference between Fulci's beauty and Argento's beauty is Argento uh, works in yeah. color and Fulci works in texture. And I don't think when he's at his best, there's like nobody who has as good of texture. And, and it's like one of those things where it's like Suspiria. If you watch it on VHS, you could really get what makes that visually striking. But right. you, it, like you need to see a nice looking version of a Fulci movie to really get it. There's a scene in this movie, the one about there's a locked door. And a normal movie would just go, wow, this door is so locked, we can't get it open. But because it's a Fulci movie, we go to the other side of the door in an extreme close-up of the locking mechanism, the deadbolt being stuck and having to be dragged out. And with every drag, there's like dust that comes off of it. And that's a kind of detail that you don't see in almost any other film. Or when she's like dusting the floor and she sees the sort of inlay of the tomb on the floor of the house. Yeah, yeah. And, and the dad assures the mom, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, there's the, plenty of uh, <laughs> plenty of areas, houses in this area. Have all these houses here, they're all filled with fucking dead people, uh, it, which I'm pretty sure isn't no. true. But, you know, it makes uh, sense. There, there is a sense. There's a purposeful, not not accidental sense of humor that Fulci constantly implies throughout, yeah. especially the way he'll edit from one scene to the next um, where like yeah. something horrific will happen. And then it will immediately cut to someone just yawning. <laughs> and stuff yeah. like that like it, it's there's an intelligence at work here despite the fact that because of the italian style of filming the performances are all terrible and the story is kind of impossible to follow um yeah like there's the first two two decades of fulci's career were making very broad comedy it, and i i think a lot of people don't even realize that and they t- and he was tri- so he knows comedy yeah. he knows what he's doing when it comes to that um, and I think this movie really works, um, and it's a lot of fun, and it's really beautiful. And I think the uh, the audio tape sequence um, is one of the most disturbing sequences in any horror movie I've ever seen. Uh, there, well, there's something about uh, a haunted house is one thing, but then finding out that someone lives in your house, and that's what you're being haunted by is an actual physical person you know, a zombie person in this case, but that's a scarier concept Mm -hmm. to me. And that's one of the things that makes this an actual scary movie is that, yeah, I mean, if it was just a haunted house, I could rationalize that away. But like the idea of someone living in your basement, you don't know they're there and they're killing people that come visit your house. is pretty out there. Um, Or or Um, like specifically, I'm talking about like the scene where he's listening to the other professor's audio tapes, uh, like audio logs of what's happening. Um, and oh, he's yeah. just like sort of screaming about what has happened and why he ended up committing suicide. And you see basically the professor's imagining of what is he is seeing. Um, and it's like uh-huh. very wild camera work and very narrow focus as it like 
as the camera glides across surfaces that are just absolutely horrific and there's just like child corpses that are really yes. graphically murdered like um it's very expressionistic and it's really affecting the u.s release of this was uh infamous for two reasons uh the first one is obvious and that uh the child actor giovanni uh frezza has a distractingly awful adult dub yes. voice in english it's like this is especially Bobby. because he has the adult name of bob <laughs> instead of the child's name of bobby yes bob um anyway uh that's one reason and it's cute because on the dvd extras they interviewed the actor and he formally apologizes for the bad dub. <laughs> <laughs> and uh but the bigger issue is that um, when the uh, when it was put on VHS and some uh, of the I believe the uh, Anchor Bay non Blue Underground DVD version, uh, some of the reels are out of order, um, and people don't notice because it's a Fulci movie. Uh, but if I remember correctly, the way to tell is that uh, the uh, real estate agent is murdered. And if you're watching the wrong version, she's murdered and then she's back again in a later scene. Which I which, which I, I mean, say is understandable to assume that Fulci would do that. Yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah, and well, yeah, you said something about audio recording. That was a thing that comes up in uh, his b- version of Black Cat. Oh too. right, yeah, uh, yeah. So he's he was into that at the time. It seems. Wait, is how many uh, movies did he make in 1981? Uh, is it those three? Three. Yeah, those God. two. Imagine having a year Ripper. like that. Yeah, and then he actually dialed back on graphic violence in his movies after New York Ripper, but then started doing violence again when straight to video stuff happened and he had uh he had major health problems and was trying to cover medical bills. So yeah, no, oh, I ended that one on a day. <laughs> uh, if but if, moving if on. that if I consider that a straight <laughs> slasher movie, it would be my favorite of nineteen eighty one. Yeah. I do not, so I, I it's a gothic horror movie with slasher influence. It's a Lucio Fulci movie. But the only, the yeah. only sla- – oh, that's not true because I guess American Werewolf in London. But it's definitely like Lucio Fulci has like two of the top five spaces or three spaces of my favorite horror movies yeah. of that year. Right. Um, okay, so next up, speaking of movies that aren't slashers, Evil Speak, directed by Eric Weston. Uh, this one is summarized as bullied by classmates, a pudgy military school student fights – back by a computer uh by computer with the devil well that doesn't make sense uh he fights back using a uh, possessed computer it's not really possessed by the devil it's possessed by a uh a uh a, a warlock basically yeah. and this one uh this is a movie that has a wonderful premise that it can't quite it just doesn't to, get but it started tries it tries, and I do enjoy it, but it just, yeah. It starts like a Hammer horror movie um, with, like, what happened in the mm-hmm. past. Um, but then it quickly becomes modern. Uh, and one one of the, the you know, we talk about uh, people playing uh, teenagers who aren't teenagers. These are supposed to be teenagers and 20-somethings at this military school. Uh, uh, these actors are so old. Clint Howard's wearing a to pay in this movie. yeah but he's still playing like a 19 year old well yeah he's like he's like a ward of state so he might even be 17 yes. like yeah yeah um so who knows it's, this is essentially carrie yes it's carrie but uh but there's uh the extra influence of a computer program, right which is something nobody knew what the fuck that was so that is like the premise is absolutely delicious the idea of like 1981 era computing already it was sort of like a weird magic like it was only the most hardcore hobbyists who had their own computers and stuff so Hmm. like the idea of that technology interacting uh with satanism um where the, the, the computer is telling it to feed it blood and stuff like that like it's almost like a weird little shop of horrors sort of a premise uh it's yeah. it's absolutely delicious, but it just takes forever to get started. They they just don't yeah. quite know how to do anything with it. And then you think, oh, here it is, a, a murder happens, and then it just goes back to like 20 minutes of nothing happening. But the final like yeah. 12 minutes, the sort of carry prom moment, is absolutely amazing. Yeah. And I don't understand why this is written down as a slasher. I can't really think of – there is a, sla- a shower scene. 
but it's not a person killing the woman it is the summoning of uh satanic pigs basically killed this woman uh in the bath i guess not the shower which is again sounds awesome (laughs) that he uses the computer to summon demonic pigs to kill a woman who steals his uh brooch i don't remember no book she steals the book um the funniest thing is that uh anton levey was apparently a really big fan of this hell yeah (laughs) um (laughs) Uh, otherwise, it is pretty violent. And some of the violence had to be cut for an R rating. It has been put all back in on video versions. Uh, at the end, when he's killing off all his tormentors, and he just happens to get them all in the same place at the same time with no one else yeah. around. And that's not a satanic influence. They just happen to wander into this area. That uh, He just sort of floats around and murders them with a giant sword. After all that, he doesn't even murder them with computer No, powers. there's no he magic, with a there's giant no rays sword. that come out of him, lasers, electricity, nothing. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's bizarre. Um, and uh, the makeup effects aren't convincing, but they're kind of fun. Uh, this was banned as a video. Na- I should say uh, House by the Cemetery was also a video nasty for obvious reasons. This was a video nasty. And I think this was because this was the era of um people thinking dungeons and dragons was going to make right okay so a movie about people probably genuinely thought this could happen (laughs) the people in britain that were like the uh parent groups that were seeing over all this stuff were probably afraid that children would somehow summon the devil with their with their apple two e's um the only last thing i want to say about this movie is that clint howard acts way better than he has to yeah he is pretty good um um the the another thing that's funny to me is that the satanic priest's name is Esteban, and it keeps showing up on screens as a scary moment. It's like Esteban, and I'm I just kept on thinking to myself if I spoke Spanish that would just be saying Steve, <laughs> Steve is coming for you. Oh Steve, and it, it just made me laugh to think. Of. Also, I found out that the place where it was filmed actually Christine looked this up for me while we were watching Garden Street Academy, uh, in Santa Barbara was literally built with Native American slavery on the order of, uh, uh, in order to convert them to Catholicism. Oof, talk about a curse set. So like, yeah, exactly. Like that's almost the better movie, but anyway. And that brings us to the end of part two. In two weeks, give or take a couple days, I will be discussing H.P. Lovecraft movies with Prophet of the Old Ones and co-host of your favorite monsters, a Scooby-Doo podcast, Betsy Jorgensen. Two weeks after that, part three of my discussion with Patrick will go live, after which I will go back to the monthly schedule for the remainder of the year. Until then, you can reach me on Twitter at either at Genre Grinder or at Gabe M, as in Matthew Powers, on the Genre Grinder Facebook page, the GenreGrinder.com website, or directly at GenreGrinder at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and I will talk to you soon. Well, so no Yeah.